from impeachments to inaugurations, if it's a political story, we are on the scene. The race for the White House is heating up. We're beating Biden. How dare he say that? If it's breaking news, we're live with the latest coverage. From the White House, the State Department, and Capitol Hill, we know the issues, but above all, we know the players to bring you the latest in-depth analysis on all the key stories that we're covering. I'm Eric Ham. Join me from Washington here on First Post America. Hello and welcome to First Post America, your global pit stop for the latest news and headlines from the United States and around the world. I'm Eric Ham coming to you from the nation's capital in Washington, D.C. We'll get you a roundup of all the top stories for the day, but first, let's take a look at the headlines. Ukraine says it has destroyed another warship in the Black Sea as Kiev's campaign builds momentum in the nearly two-year war. In fact, NATO calls it a great victory. Adding to its string of weapons tests, North Korea fires multiple cruise missiles off its east coast, maintaining its aggressive posture set by its leader, Kim Jong-un. Democrat Tom Suozzi wins the special election in New York to replace ousted Republican George Santos. The result means an even more narrow majority for House Republicans. Polls in Indonesia came to a close and preliminary results show a strong lead for Defense Minister Subianto in the race for the presidency. And pressure mounts on the Turkish government to shut down a controversial gold mine as efforts continue to rescue nine workers trapped by a massive landslide. We begin in the Middle East, where Israel says it is now closer to ensnaring the mastermind of the brazen October 7th attack on Israel. The Israeli military released a video that reportedly shows Hamas leader Yahya Sinwar inside a tunnel below Gaza city of Khan Yunis. The IDF says Sinwar was with his wife, children, and brother, Ibrahim Sinwar. Israel says the footage had been captured on a Hamas CCTV camera on October 10th and has been obtained by its military in recent days. The IDF says the video obtained shows Sinwar's escape to one of the safe houses he built in advance. The video is said to be the first images of Sinwar since the war broke out. This evening, we are releasing a footage of the mass murder and mastermind behind the Hamas massacre of October 7th, Ichi Sinwar. This video is one of many that we have obtained since October 7th. Sinwar started a war with Israel, a war that Israel did not seek, a war that has caused immense suffering to Israelis and Palestinians alike. While the people of Gaza are suffering above ground, Sinwar is hiding in tunnels underground underneath them, running like the coward that he is, with one of his wives and children and his brother leading the, the way. Now the Hamas leader is Israel's most wanted man and the military's top target of the war in Gaza. Israel has repeatedly said that it will not stop until Sinwar is captured dead or alive. So far, the Hamas leader has remained elusive despite intense bombings of Khan Yunus, his hometown. Meanwhile, Israel is facing growing international pressure to agree to a ceasefire as it prepares for a ground incursion in Rafah, which is now home to more than one million displaced Palestinians. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has vowed to defeat Hamas gunmen he says are hiding in the city. In fact, earlier this week, Israel conducted a pre-dawn raid in Rafah and around 100 Palestinians were killed and the IDF rescued at least two hostages. The United Nations warns an attack on Rafah would be devastating and could lead to slaughter. So my sincere hope is that uh, the negotiations 
for the release of hostages and uh, some form of uh, uh, cessation of hostilities to be successful, to avoid a all-out uh, offensive over Rafa, where the core of the humanitarian system is located, and that would have devastating consequences. Now, South Africa has urged the U.N. top court to place more legal pressure on Israel to halt its offensive against Rafah. Pretoria has, in fact, already approached the International Court of Justice. It has lodged a complaint against Israel alleging that its assault on Gaza amounts to a breach of the Genocide Convention. The ruling on the case is pending. However, the court ordered Israel to take action to, pr 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 to protect Palestinian civilians from further harm. The United States is also reviewing reports that Israel harmed civilians in Gaza. Now, this is under a set of guidelines aimed at ensuring that countries receiving arms from America conduct military operations in line with international humanitarian law. We are reviewing incidents in the current conflict according to the process set out in the CHURG. That process is not intended to uh, uh, function as a rapid response mechanism. Rather, it is designed to systematically assess civilian harm incidents and develop appropriate policy responses to reduce the risk of such incidents recurring in the future and to drive partners to conduct military operations in accordance with international humanitarian law. So you do have CHIRP processes looking into Israel's military conduct? We do. We, we have said that before, yes. Okay. Meanwhile, talks involving the United States, Egypt, Israel, and Qatar on a Gaza truce continue in Cairo. A Hamas delegation heads to the Egyptian capital for a second round of talks after Israeli negotiators held discussions on Tuesday. And on to the United States, where the Republican-controlled House of Representatives voted to impeach Joe Biden's top border official. This comes as immigration shapes up to be a major issue in the November elections. By an extremely narrow vote of 214 to 213, the House approved two articles of impeachment accusing the Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas of not enforcing U.S. immigration laws. On this vote, the yeas are 214 and the nays are 213. The resolution is adopted. Pursuant to Section 2A of House Resolution 996, House Resolution 995 is hereby adopted. The vote marked just the second time in U.S. history and the first time in almost 150 years that the House impeached a member of the president's cabinet. Republican Representative Steve Scalise, who missed last week's vote while he received treatment for cancer, provided the deciding vote on Tuesday. Three Republicans, including Mike Gallagher of Wisconsin, Ken Buck of Colorado, and Tom McClintock of California, all voted against impeachment. They said impeachment did not meet the bar laid out in the Constitution. Constitutional experts say that the House investigation of Mayorkas actually failed to provide evidence of high crimes and misdemeanors that were cited as reasons for impeachment. However, even with Mayorkas impeached in the House, it is highly unlikely that he will be convicted in the Democratic-controlled Senate. The impeachment does reverse an embarrassing legislative defeat that Speaker Mike Johnson suffered last week when a similar effort fell short due to Republican defections and absences. Republicans argue Mayorkas' actions led to record flows of migrants crossing the U.S.-Mexico border. They also accuse him of making false statements to Congress. Meanwhile, Mayorkas has said he does not bear responsibility for the border situation he says it is due to a broken immigration system that Congress has failed to fix. Last week, speaking to reporters, Mayorkas said that the allegations were, were against him were baseless and false. The allegations are baseless, and I'm focused on the work, which was what brings me to Las Vegas today. Our Republicans have indicated they may hold another vote, and they might uh, have the numbers at that point to impeach you. Uh, if that happened, would you consider stepping aside? No, I would not. Now, in a statement, U.S. President Joe Biden called the impeachment a blatant act of unconstitutional partisanship 
and a petty political game. House Republicans have been under pressure from their base to hold Special Biden counsel. and his administration accountable over immigration and border policies. In fact, former President Donald Trump has made border security a major focus of his campaign against Joe Biden. In December of 2023, border authorities encountered more than 225,000 migrants along the U.S.-Mexico border, the highest monthly total recorded since 2000. Throughout the month, authorities dealt with over 10,000 migrants crossing daily. However, in January, the number of migrants arrested crossing the southern border illegally dropped 50 percent. And now staying on Donald Trump, President Biden continues to go after the Republican presidential frontrunner over his NATO comments. Here's President Biden speaking out. Now, Trump had earlier suggested that the United States would not protect NATO allies who are not spending enough on defense from a potential Russian invasion. Now, Biden has called Trump's remarks dumb, shameful, and un-American. Here's what Donald Trump had to say and how Joe Biden responded. One of the presidents of a big country stood up and said, well, sir, uh, if we don't pay and we're attacked by Russia, will you protect us? I said, you didn't pay? You're delinquent? He said, yes, let's say that happened. No, I would not protect you. In fact, I would encourage them to do whatever the hell they want. You got to pay. You got to pay your bills. And the money came flowing in. Can you imagine a former president of the United States saying that? The whole world heard it. And the worst thing is he means it. No other president in our history has ever bowed down to a Russian dictator. Well, let me say this as clearly as I can. I never will. For God's sake, it's dumb, it's shameful, it's dangerous, it's un-American. And staying in the United States, a major snowstorm has battered the Northeast. A nor'easter is one of the strongest in the last two years blanketing cities with over a foot of snow. Millions of residents woke up to white conditions. Over 45 million people received winter weather alerts. And the conditions made travel dangerous with almost 1,500 flights being canceled and another 2,700 flights being delayed. The cities of New York and Boston closed down airport operations temporarily. However, inconsistent flight operations are expected to last for at least another day. But it wasn't just air travel that was severely impacted by the snowstorm. Several roads were covered under heaps of snow and some roads developed black ice. In fact, emergency responders and police officers worked around the clock and more than 2,000 car accidents were reported with the majority of them coming from Pennsylvania. New York City officials even went so far as to place a ban on vehicles in some areas and urged residents to stay indoors. I encourage all New Yorkers to continue to remain cautious. Uh, one of the things we are concerned about later today and into tomorrow morning is as the temperatures warm up, we could see some of the snow melt uh, that could then turn to ice when it refreezes. So that is something to consider uh, on the roadways. And it wasn't just the adults who were asked to restrict their travel. In fact, thousands of students from New York, Pennsylvania, and Massachusetts had to switch from physical classes to remote, remote learning. Yet the snowstorm also knocked out electricity for thousands, making it impossible for students to attend classes remotely. In New York City, almost 900,000 students were unable to log in. City has a remote slash snow day. So this morning, everyone was supposed to get up and get on to um, either check in with their teachers or get their assignments, and the system wasn't working. Meanwhile, New York City's public schools chancellor, David Banks, blamed tech issues on the software giant IBM. IBM was not ready for prime time. <laughs> and that's what happened here. Um, our, our entire team had been geared up. Um, and we told them that almost a million students by between 7.30 and 8 o'clock this morning would be coming online to go to school. And at around that time, they said we were overwhelmed with the surges. To say that I am uh, disappointed, frustrated, uh, and angry uh, is an understatement. And I want all parents 
of our school, of our students across the entire city to understand that I share the frustration that many of them had to endure from this morning. Now, New York City Mayor Eric Adams defended the decision for remote learning, claiming that students had already fallen behind during the COVID-19 pandemic. Classes are, in fact, are unlikely to resume for at least another day as the roads continue to remain buried under snow. However, everything wasn't all gloomy as the weather inspired some residents to actually embrace the snow. Valentine's Day, yeah. Um, we have uh, probably about four inches um, and it'll stop for a little bit and then it, it's, it's continuing on. Um, it's a great snow though because make a snowball. It's a wet, wet snow. <laughs> so it's fun snow. Now, the storm ended a nearly two year snow drought for New York City, making it the snowiest day for the Big Apple since January of 2022. And from the snowy conditions in the United States to the not so snowy regions of the Arctic, a new study says that polar bears are in fact starving. Normally, polar bears hunt on ice sheets in the Arctic Circle. They munch on protein and fat rich seals. But global warming and climate change means longer periods without ice. And now polar bears have to eat berries, fruits, and smaller animals they find on land. Human activity is to be blamed for the snowless Arctic. So what does this mean for the future of polar bears? Here's our full report. Polar bears are at the risk of starvation. The climate crisis is melting ice sheets in the Arctic. Polar bears would use these ice sheets as their hunting grounds. The usual prey were protein and fat-rich seals. But as global warming continues, the ice sheets continue to melt faster than ever. During the summer months, polar bears are forced to migrate to land. And instead of finding tasty, scrumptious seals, the bears have to settle for tiny snacks like berries, fruits and small animals. This means that they aren't able to consume the calories that they need and remain in a deficit. Polar bears often use the summer months to put on mass as they prepare for the rough winter. But with only small treats available on land, the polar bears have no choice but to eat what they get. And a new study has found that this is leaving the bears hungry and causing starvation. The research suggests that 19 out of 20 polar bears have lost up to 11% of their body mass on average. The new diet, which the bears have to adapt to, is to be blamed for this problem. Foods, particularly that they were getting when they were on land, have pretty low caloric content. And the bears have to expend energy to obtain them. So out on the sea ice, they're primarily a sit and wait predator. And they're eating primarily the fat of seals, which has twice the calories of protein and carbohydrates, which is what they are primarily getting when they're on land. Similarly, when they were swimming out into the bay and encountering carcasses, we found that it was difficult for them to eat those carcasses while they were swimming. Um, and, you know, they're getting a single carcass over a three week period versus, you know, catching seals every few days out on the sea ice. Shrinking ice caps is a major concern for polar bears and Arctic wildlife. The bears are struggling to adapt to climate change. Climate scientists are worried about the patterns that they're noticing. I think our study confirms kind of previous evidence that they're not very adaptable to spending time on land, um, that there's going to have to be other changes that would have to occur. They're going to help them withstand, um, you know, spending longer times on land. The lesser food the polar bears find, the more they become vulnerable. With ice sheets vanishing, so does their staple food of seals. Without a hefty meal that the seals provide, raising cubs has become difficult for mother bears. Partly because some of the research in my group is indicating that that is a very vulnerable link in the population. And so our concern is that once mothers with cubs uh, lose their body condition to a certain point, they stop producing milk. And all of a sudden, at that point, the cubs now have to rely on their own fat reserves. There are only about 25,000 polar bears remaining in the world, and they've become an endangered species due to climate change. Global temperatures continue to rise, and the Arctic region is heating up at between two to four times faster than the rest of the world. 
With no ice caps, we would have no polar bears. The region may be thousands and thousands of kilometers away from population centers, but that doesn't mean the world can simply turn a blind eye. After all, ice caps and polar bears are vital for a healthy planet. On Valentine's Day, while most people across the world celebrate love, for some it can be challenging. And if you're one of those spending Valentine's Day thinking about an ex who shattered your heart into a million pieces, here's a not so conventional way to turn that frown upside down. Some zoos in the United States can turn your ex into a cockroach. Yes, you heard that right. Our next report gives you more detail. With Valentine's Day upon us, everything appears to be soaked in love. Social media is filled with people showing off their exuberant love lives. Markets are flooded with a variety of gifts waiting to be bought. After all, love deserves to be celebrated, right? However, for some people, Valentine's Day is synonymous with hurt and hate. The day of love is nothing less than a day of sulking and cursing exes. Those cheesy posts and love-filled gestures are reminders of heartbreak for some. Well, not everyone has a love life worth celebrating. In this time of disdain and vulnerability, if you think you have no one, well, then you're wrong. Because some zoos and animal shelters in the US have ideas that will cheer you up. They want to join the club of hating your ex. Because now they're just somebody that you used to know. Several zoos in the US will let you name a cockroach after your ex. For instance, the San Antonio Zoo in Texas organizes an annual fundraiser called the Crimea Cockroach. The fundraiser allows a person to name a roach after their ex. They then feed the creepy crawly to a resident animal. The best part is you can watch the activity and hear the crunch as the animal chews the roach. The zoo authorities charge a fee of $10 and then use that money for the zoo's maintenance. In New York's Bronx Zoo, you get to keep the cockroach. The Bronx Zoo allows a person to name a Madagascar hissing cockroach after their ex. For a fee of $15, the zoo authorities will send a digital certificate to the person after whom the roach has been named. If a person is willing to shell out an additional $20, then a virtual meeting with the cockroach can also be set up. The Madagascar hissing cockroaches are considered the world's largest roach species. In 2023, Canada's Toronto Zoo launched a similar campaign called Name a Roach. They offered people to name a cockroach in someone's honour for a fee of $25. There's also the New Jersey Animal Shelter's Neuter Your Ex program. For a donation of $50, the shelter will name a community cat after an ex. They will then spay or neuter, vaccinate and ear tip the cat. The shelter launched this campaign to control the overpopulation of feral cats in the area. The campaign got an enthusiastic response and the shelter now plans to extend it. That's all for the show for today. We certainly look forward to seeing you again tomorrow and thank you so much for watching. From impeachments to inaugurations, if it's a political story, we are on the scene. The race for the White House is heating up. We're beating Biden. How dare he say that? If it's breaking news, we're live with the latest coverage. From the White House, the State Department, and Capitol Hill, we know the issues, but above all, we know the players to bring you the latest in-depth analysis on all the key stories that we're covering. I'm Eric Ham. Join me from Washington here on First Post America.